Sweet. It says we're live. So barring any technical difficulties like we had last week, we can probably just roll right into it. What a, a few things on the agenda that I'd kind of like to talk about tonight. I've, I've got my top 10 money myths um, that I'd like to offer to my group. For you guys that are um, fairly new uh, to the channel, I'd like to welcome you because I feel like in finances, we buy into a lot of the myths um, as opposed to focus on what's really important to help you guys out. But some of the things that have kind of come up um, with regard to, um, you know, different channel creators, I'd kind of like to air a little bit of um, what I feel you guys who are new to the independent investor channel can expect to get out of the channel. Um, I'm not one of those folks that toots my own horn. It's um, one of my least favorite subjects. I don't do that. Um, I really enjoy helping people. But here's the thing. If I get on here and I talk about how great my channel is, um, I, I don't really think that helps anybody. Um, furthermore, if you came on the channel and you liked my message and you said that I was the greatest channel that you had seen, um, that really doesn't hold water with me uh, either. OK, what really holds water is the message and the impact um, in your in your financial lives. What I mean by that is. If you can take the information and you can deploy it for yourself um, and it's helpful to you, then therein lies the uh, success of a particular channel like mine. OK, and I will share in some of that success. Um, but I, I think we're probably uh, uh, much more acceptive of information than I think we should be on certain channels that offer content without really any acknowledgement to the validation um, of the information, furthermore, the impact of that information on people's real lives, okay? Um, and I really just thought I would kind of put that out there. And a lot of you guys that are probably joining the channel for the first time, you're probably thinking, okay, Ryan, what is your channel all about? I've been investing for a long time in the stock market, okay? And I've talked about evolving as a stock market in investor. I started when I was around 16 years old. We had a financial planner come out to the house and talk to us. And it was my very first introduction to financial planning. Um, talked really elegantly about the you know rule of 72. Talked about the benefits of mutual funds. Talked about the year over year return that you could expect to get out of a well-managed mutual fund, et cetera. And it sounded really good. Um, so when I actually started making a little bit of money um, at my first, I got my first job when I was 16 years old. Um, and I've been working ever since. And trust me, guys, sometimes I get kind of tired of work. Um, but, um, you know, I've, I've got my eye on the horizon as far as, you know, retirement possibilities for myself. But, you know, I started with that. And then I actually got into my first brokerage house. And that was probably my first introduction. Yeah, intelligent investors on. on and I've got financial investor. That's fantastic. Guys, I, I really enjoy having uh, you guys as other creators. There's, there's the third channel creator right there. It's awesome to have you guys. Seriously, it's it's pretty cool. Um, hopefully, we can have a forum discussion about finances. Certainly, a lot of topics. Um, I did add some stock this week that's probably worth throwing out there for the group. I still intend on doing a portfolio review so you guys can kind of see where the rubber re meets the road for me. Um, I will offer that. Um, I'll probably do some filming uh, probably tomorrow uh, to get some content, as you guys can and can very well attest to. My upload schedule has um, has uh, slowed down immensely. Um, I've got a lot going on right now, uh, personally and professionally, and I've just decided to throttle back on the uh, on the schedule uh, for uploads, and that's just the way it's going to be for a while. Um, I've got a lot of great content online that I worked really hard to get online. Um, so you guys that are new to the channel, Nail is on awesome. I, I wonder if it's as cold up there as it is here. It was cold today in New York, no doubt. We need to get this spring going. But uh, anyway, like I was talking about, you know, with the evolution of my, you know, going with the financial planner and I, I took a $10,000 check to my very first financial planner, um, put it in the stock market only to realize that uh, stock never got bought. It actually sat in a money market account um, and the stock market went up really high. And um, the uh, broker didn't um, didn't actually buy me the uh, the mutual funds that we had talked about. So I was like, man, this is crazy. 
Um, that was kind of my first introduction. And when he did actually get around to actually buying me the shares after I had met with him a second time, um, I actually put me into um, class C shares uh, of, of a particular mutual fund. Um, and if you guys don't understand, you always want to opt for class A shares, no matter what you go for. Um, there's class A, B and C shares. And basically um, it has to do with your voting rights. But if you, you, if you actually look at their overall performance, <laughs> I'm in Oregon. Oregon will always be home for me. Trust me. I, I cannot wait to get back there. I, I'm about as far away from home as I can possibly be. <laughs> it sounds like a Grand Funk Railroad song, actually. But yeah, I, I miss home. Oregon will always be home for me. So that's awesome. I, I see your pictures, Brent, on there all the time, man. I'm, I'm jealous. I'm, I'm owned right now by the government. So, But um, after I got done with that debacle, I actually hooked up with Edward Jones. And I was with Edward Jones for a long, long time. Still very uneducated about the prospects of you know, financial planning, what it meant, what other, I, I thought there was no other options out there to go with. And um, I was with Edward Jones for close to 10 years, learned a lot about um, financial planning, um, got to deal with different brokers because I'm forced to move around the country as a lot of you guys know, right, with my affiliation. But um, it forced me to get different opinions from different brokers. I don't, I didn't just settle in, put my line in the sand and just listen you know, to the first person that kind of came along, um, 11 Celsius and rain. Yeah, that's, that's cold. No doubt. I, I remember Detroit uh, over the winter, some cold winters up there, no doubt. And doing inspections of my coveralls for sure. It's good to have you guys on board. Um, I'm going to kind of take a pulse of the, of the group here tonight. Um, try to turn back as much value as we can. Um, I enjoy the heck out of doing these. I really hope you guys enjoy it as well. Um, I thought last week's discussion was fantastic. Um, and honestly, I'll keep doing it as long as it benefits at least one person. If it can benefit one person, um, I'll keep doing it. I, I think it's uh, pretty cool to actually um, go on here. I don't I don't script these. I just go on um, and just kind of react to who comes on and what questions you guys have and, and what you need answered. Um, you know, Apple's coming up in the discussion for sure. <laughs> it just becomes more of a buy. The, the further down it goes, the more of a buy that it gets. Geez, I've got average Joe. Hey, Dave, what's going on, man? It's good to see you on again. Very cool. Yep, I've got Juan right on. It's good to see you guys. I'll, I'll give it a few minutes before um, starting to filter in, but kind of being with Edward Jones really kind of taught me to, to, to really gain access and start to look behind the scenes about you know, how productive my money was actually being. Okay. Like I, I just always found it weird that I could go in, sit down with a financial planner. They've got to put on a suit every single day and it was seemingly free of charge. And it just never really sat well with me. Um, and when I started to get into the back door of really understanding the cost basis um, of those fees, that's what really kind of set me off on this tangent um, and this project of really understanding for myself um, what, what, uh, you know, what I was paying for. And, uh, you know, when, when I, when I started to really realize the cost of it, it was like, okay, I, I just thought it was the cost of doing business. You know, what other options are out there? And I was actually cold called from Merrill edge. And I tell them all the time. I'm like, I never respond to cold calls. I don't even answer my phone. If I get a, an unsolicited phone call, I don't even answer. Um, but I actually answered this one. Uh, and it was from Merrill Edge. And sure enough, man, they were they were offering the self-directed program. They had just rolled it out. And I was like, man, this is awesome. Tell me more. Um, did a lot of research before I actually transitioned over. But that was the last um, brokerage. So for you guys, you know, that are tuning into the channel new, um, I just basically offer a testimonial to what I do in my own investment life. So um, kind of stand by within the next couple of weeks, I'm going to actually be putting my portfolio online. I have no problem with doing that. Um, kind of let you guys know how I've got my portfolio built. Okay. And make no mistake about it. I teach along the principles that no portfolio needs to be the same. Okay. And <clears throat> there's a topic that I kind of want to discuss tonight about you guys kind of maybe observing your portfolios a little bit too much. Okay. I want you to focus on 
what it is that you can control with your financial picture via budget, via debt control, um, via your, you, you know, getting your budget maybe um, identified and whittled down. Because once you've got your portfolio holdings in place, really buying is on the table all the time. Holding is, is a decision that you can exercise at any given time. But I really, really want you to hold off on trying to justify selling a stock this earlier in your in your evolution. And I talk about the real impact, okay? I've got you guys invested in a self-directed account, okay? Bar none, that's the most important thing that you can do. Second of which, get the majority of your assets held within that self-directed account with nice passive low cost or low fee products within there. All right, because at the end of the day, I don't really care what you invest in as long as we can get you that seven to eight to nine, maybe 10% rate of return in the safest manner, okay? So I don't really care what you invest in as long as we can reach that goal year over year um, without you messing with it very much so it can kind of pay you back in the future, all right? Um, Juan O says, thanks for doing this. I, I just hit record one night, actually, and... Um, I was talking to my brother, actually, who kind of helps me on the channel. He's in my Facebook group, actually. You guys will see there's actually three Chartiers, actually. Um, we're all three brothers. But, um, uh, yeah, we were kind of talking about um, th this is something I really enjoy doing. Um, I, I really enjoy when the questions come through. If you guys have, um, you know, something specific that you want me to address, um, it's not just for your benefit. It's for the entire um Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, London. Yeah, I wish I was in London right now. Yeah, the upload will be recorded and I'll put it online for you, man, when you wake up uh, having your breakfast and uh, and tea. No problem. <laughs> All these live streams get uploaded to my YouTube. That's the least I can do. Um, I upload them. I, I do put uh, commercials in them, which is I understand it's a pain in the neck. I get it. If you don't like them, just skip over them. I don't really care. Um, if you want, I, some of them are long and annoying. I get it. Some channel creators um, don't even monetize their stuff for the sheer purpose that they monetize in other ways. Um, I, I would like to get some sort of compensation. And, and that's, I'm trying to basically just play ball um, with the program that YouTube has laid in front of me. That That's all. So um, I hope the audience doesn't mind. I, I, I wouldn't mind. Um, if somebody was offering a message as important as mine um, and, and asking for a little bit of uh, monetization. So I, I, I think that's OK. I mean, I really don't care I, either way. If Washington. Yeah. You know where Gig Harbor is? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seattle's my old stomping grounds for sure. Now I've been all over. No doubt. I've got a lot of life I've packed into 40 years. I've been a lot of cool places. No doubt. A lot, of, a lot of what you guys don't know about me is, you know, right now you guys know I'm working on a, uh, over a decade in the military. I've got going on 13, going on 13 years now. Um, but I used to actually be a commercial fisherman. So I actually worked out of Seattle, um, Everett, Washington. Um, so I've got uh, 1979 wood uh, on the line right now from Washington. Yeah, man, the great Northwest. It's awesome. I've been all the way up to the top of Alaska, Bering Sea, et cetera, all the way down to Baja uh, Peninsula, no doubt. Commercial fish out of Los Angeles, California as well. So all, all over all over the West Coast. So it's good to have you on board. Seriously, hit me up with your guys' questions. Um, while I'm kind of letting this group filter in, it's really cool. Uh, I hope I gave proper shout outs. I've got four channel creators um, on the line here. I'm actually going to be kind of filtering through. Um, I'm probably going to add, um, there's one channel creator that I don't have endorsed on my channel. Um, and I'm going to change that actually as early as this weekend. Um, so I'm going to be actually going through. Yeah. So there's Texas. Another one of my uh, stomping grounds. Greetings from Texas, everyone. IBM thoughts. Um, I was really surprised. They actually beat on the earnings. Um, the problem with IBM, comparatively speaking, you're looking at IBM compared to other companies, CRM Salesforce really is kind of eating their lunch. But you got to understand IBM, you know, it's it's got its legacy businesses that are making its money and it's got accelerated business in the cloud now. I hate to really give you the advice to continue to hold that stock, but 
that's just what you've got to do with a good value play. I, I, IBM is going to shake this thing out, no doubt about it. Um, just fierce competition, and, and it's a result to, to, to really show and demonstrate how long a turnaround takes. And I, I don't know if these guys just get complacent or what the deal is, but um, it, they, they were really scared into kind of a restructuring with IBM. And I actually think they're coming down the front side of the wave right now. I really do. I think the worst is behind them. Um, you know, it's been in this training range for the last three or four years in between 130 and 170, you know, you're looking at it right here in the mid 140s, high 140s, right? It just got whacked after its earnings. And it was interesting because it was actually a couple penny beat. So I um, hate to give you the advice, but I, I would actually um, look to keep the stock if you're a holder and, and you know, a 10 share position at 1500 bucks right here to, to, to rake in a 4% dividend really is kind of a kind of attractive on a value play because I actually think they're trading at around 11 times earnings. So yeah, IBM, I, I'd pick it up right here. If you're a holder of the stock, I would just continue to hold it. So that's advice I'd give family. So, so greetings from Texas. Another one of my old stomping grounds, man, I've been all over the place. Hey, Jake, laugh out loud. You're Marines, right? Yeah. Jake's, Jake's one of my, we can talk the same language, man. I tell you what, the military is extremely deficient in their investing education. No doubt about it. And I, I've got guys that seek me out all the time, but I've got to be kind of careful, you know. I mean, this I, I can help, you know, the, the vast majority of people. But it's amazing to me how many people have a general interest in finances, but um you know, will will demonstrate that excitement for me, but they'll never actually act on that excitement. And I never really understood that, which kind of brings me to a topic that I want to talk about with the group. And something that you guys are going to struggle with is finding balance. Okay, you find balance. There's actually a reason why. This is one of my favorite statues I've got behind me because it really reminds me to avoid overexposure, which is one of my biggest mistakes that I've addressed on some of my investing videos. You really need to work at finding balance. And how do you do that? If you go through the volatility that we've had in the last couple months, I constantly want you guys to reevaluate where you've been, what you've been through, and what you would change going forward. You have to constantly do that, okay? And as a self-directed investor, we really do have the luxury of putting a lot of emphasis on a lot of different avenues, not just one, okay? I'm not talking about a proprietary portfolio that a fund manager gets paid on off of your back every quarter. I'm not talking about that. The investing piece is, is easy. But what we can look at is how much of our holdings do we have relative to how much cash we have over here, how much in relation to the income that we're bringing in, and are we comfortable with this amount over here? And you really need to be honest. If you guys have $10,000 to your name and you've got $8,000 invested in the stock market, that might be okay for you. But if it is not okay for you guys and you guys have kind of overexposed a little bit, you're fine, right? Just try to build up that cash reserves until you get to a point where you are comfortable with the amount of exposure that you have to the stock market and with the amount of accessible cash that you have over here, okay? Right now, I'm looking at about uh, probably around 175, 180, around 200,000 of invested capital over here and around $100,000 of cash over here. So that's that kind of give you an idea. 66% invested in the stock market and the rest of it to me is accessible in, in, in cash. And a lot of people would say, Ryan, that's crazy. You're a younger guy. You need to have this cash working. That's just what works for me, okay? I'm not saying that if you had 95% of your portfolio invested in the stock market, that that's not okay for you. But here's what's not okay. To have 95% invested in the stock market and take a 30 or 40% downturn, and then you complain about it, okay? You have to understand, if you've learned anything over the last couple months, stocks will go up and stocks will go down. And the defensive posture in it when it's going up and when it's going down, especially, is to not look at it and trust that the amount to, to constantly look at balance 
in your in your portfolio okay when we're talking specific to finance things constantly happen to buy stock buy stock you get the stock market that go down 250 points like it did today right and you you just you want to buy every day okay some days the prudent move is going to be to do nothing all right i'm trying to build a solid portfolio foundation using vanguard etfs i currently have voo and recently added vbk based on your opinions um should I add, I'm looking at VBK future. Um, I, I honestly am kind of an advocate of not spreading yourself too thin, okay? Because an ETF in and of itself is an asset that is built to spread you thin in a good way, okay? Spread thin in a good way is diversification, okay? And a lot of people hit me up, what are the benefits of paying $250 for one share of an ETF that's VOO. The, the benefit is that you're buying that diversification right away. So in my particular account, guys, I have VOO and, and in the other account, I have VTI. I actually think that's reverse. I have VTI, my spouse has VOO. If you wanted to build a self-directed portfolio just specifically around that one ETF, you could do that. You could do that. I I do own the VPU actually, which is the uh, utilities ETF. Um, and you've added some diversification. I have to look at the VBK one. Hit me up, please, and let me know what that is, guys. I don't have all this committed to memory, and I don't have Vanguard's page open. Um, but what what type of exposure does VBK give you? If some of you guys, uh, Brent's on here. He probably knows. Um, but help me out a little bit on the VBK. But guys, don't. Don't try to buy everything under the sun, okay? I, I, I tailor it down. Look how many financial products are out there on the market right now. It's crazy. And you could build an entire portfolio specifically off of the Vanguard site. You don't have to look at anything else. No iShares, no PowerShares, no nothing. You don't have to look anywhere else because I know that these are going to deliver you a good product. And I don't mind you owning two or three ETF if, if that's what you want, okay? I'm not saying don't do that, all right? But you really only need one broad-based diversified product. And then I talked last week about kind of the perils of trying to pick different sectors like utilities or staples. You might say, okay, well, staples have just been beat down. Now is the time to buy staples. What if you're wrong, okay? What if you're wrong? And, the, and it's the what if you're wrong part that kind of always drives me to let you guys know that you really should be looking at um, the S&P 500 and the total stock market index, okay? The VTI has exposure to around 3,600 stocks. The S&P 500 has the best uh, 500 U.S. stocks, all right, for your, for, for, for your exposure. Don't worry about getting your international exposure right away. A lot of people are just looking to start. All right. And that start really is adequate if you're just looking to buy the VOO. You guys are underestimating the power of that particular ETF and just owning that ETF, funding it and building it up. Because I talk all the time. That's an ETF that you could have 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 or $1 million in. Why? Because it doesn't matter if you have a thousand. It doesn't matter if you have a million. You're still diversified across that those, that entire holding. Everything that goes up, you're going to benefit from. Everything that you're going to go that goes down, you're going to you're going to be uh, you're going to uh, you're going to hurt from that. But on an average, we're looking for that in, index to return you a positive year over year average rate of return uh, of seven, eight, nine percent. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. That's a good question. Um, I have 12 years of service cur uh, currently Air National. Oh, that's cool. I, I think I know that. That, that. I think you've mentioned that before, Juan. That's awesome. Um, but I have over five years of active time. I don't think I'm going into the blended program. Uh, I don't think I'm going into the blended program. I'm going to stay with the current system. Uh, yeah, I, I'm assuming that you've looked at your eligibility. I was ineligible for the blended um, I always talk about anybody with over 10 years, probably better to stay with the legacy system. Anybody that's less than 10 years, especially closer to a first tour, um, probably should stay away from um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the legacy and look at the potential of opting into the blended 
um, for the sheer purpose of the transferability. I didn't know that only 20% of people who serve in our military actually make it to retirement. That's a fact. I didn't know that. Um, so if you're one of those folks that just think because you're in the military, you're automatically going to make it to 20 years, um, one in five make it. OK, so that's kind of a, a good statistic. But I, I think you've chosen wisely. I, I don't want to take a reduction in my pension at 20 years from uh, from 50 percent guaranteed down to 40 percent. I don't want to do that. So um, do you put any way in your TSP? <laughs> I don't know if Brent's talking to me. Um, but I do. I do 10% of my income in the TSP, and I've got a pretty good amount there. Um, I, I kind of invest the same way in the TSP. I've got the C fund, the S fund, and the I fund. Um, the majority of my holdings, 70% of my holdings in the C, um, which is an index fund, and then the S and the I fund for the remaining 30%. So um, Roth is nice. Yeah, I've, I've got my stuff in the uh, TSP Roth or the Roth TSP. So uh, for a stock only portfolio, do you have recommended number of stocks to have at one time? Yeah, that's a killer question. Um, it kind of goes along with my, uh, overexposure or over diversified posture. And the problem a lot of people have, if I had the money, I would have a portfolio of a hundred stocks, no doubt about it. Okay. Because I just have a ton of, there's a, I could rattle off companies right now that are my favorites that I don't own. Caterpillar, 3M, Lockheed Martin, um, Boeing, um, Northrop Grumman I don't own anymore, Raytheon, basically every defense name out there. I love Stryker. Um, Home Depot I sold this week on the run-up. That was a quick trade for me, but I would definitely own that. Tractor Supply I love right here. General Mills, I love on this downturn. That's 10 right there, guys, that I don't own. So I, I, I love good companies, and there's a lot of good companies out there. Do I need to own them all, right, is the question. The answer is no, okay? And um, I was talking to somebody before the live stream about my top five stocks that you could own forever. Apple, J.P. Morgan Chase, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, and Disney. Those five right now have all five been beat down, all five of them. If you were looking to build a good portfolio with those five cornerstones, now is a pretty good entry point. What I'm trying to get across to new investors is to build the passive piece first, okay? If you're gonna go with single stock allocation and you've got, let's say $5,000, okay? Make sure that 75% of those dollars are allocated to the VOO or a really, really good S&P 500 index. You can go with the SPY if that's what you want, um, VOO or the VTI, the Vanguard's total index, and make sure that 75% of your assets are housed in that good passive baseline first. Then start picking away at those individual stocks as you see fit. But what I don't want to see is I don't want to see portfolios with $10,000 and you own 10 stocks, okay? I, I, you're, you're spreading your money way too thin and you own 10 stocks and you may think that you're diversified, you're not, you're not. I would rather see you take that $10,000 and put the whole thing on the S&P 500, all right? And my point is, if you wanted to get into single stock allocation, go with the 75%, take $7,500 and put it to the S&P 500 and then take the remaining 2,500 and buy increments of $500 blocks of each of those five stocks that I, I talked about. That's a killer portfolio. I can see you doing that, but I don't wanna see anybody with less than $10,000 spread way too thin. If you've got $5,000, pick your favorite two and go ahead and start a cornerstone and start accumulating those dividends. That's why I would recommend looking at Johnson Johnson and Procter first. Apple does pay a dividend. The Apple's a good uh, candidate as well. Whatever you guys want to invest in, would start those positions. That's fine. But I certainly don't want to see you try to buy everything under the sun, right, to where you're overexposed. Because remember, that S&P 500 index diversifies you right away, irregardless of the amount, all right? That was a really, really good question, really good question. There's no right or wrong answer to that. You're not gonna hear me 
say, look, I, Ryan, I want 50% in passive. That's why I've provided that option to you guys to say, I want 50 in passive and I want 50 in single stock, right? So if that's your thing, I, I'm not going to tell you that you, you're not going to succeed in that because you will. You will succeed in that. It's just that buying that 50%, don't misconstrue that that 50% of just stock is diversified because it's not, okay? The 50% that you hold in that passive ETF is in fact diversified, all right? And, and it can work for you, all right? But you get one of these stocks that takes a good leg down and it, and it, and it may really affect your uh, compounding effect going forward, all right? That was an awesome question. Thank you, golf fish. That was killer. Uh, small cap growth. Yeah, good. I, that's kind of what I thought, Juan. I think that's good doing that. Um, I think you'd be okay throwing a mid-cap growth in there too. The VTI has um, some mid-cap exposure in there. Um, so if you wanted to just own the VTI and the VP, uh, VBK, I'm good with that because what could end up happening is small caps will outpace and you'll end up picking a couple extra percentages of accumulation. I, I think that's a good plan. I, you'll win with that. Um, and hopefully the expense ratio isn't too crazy on that. So um, just make sure that you're being cognizant and aware of that expense ratio. I know it's coming off of my favorite website with Vanguard, but you still want to be aware of it, okay? Financial investor. This is Brent. I've known Brent for a long time. It's one of those channels that I've um, supported ever since, I, I think, the beginning of his channel. I think we kind of started YouTube about the same time. We really have, I, I don't think a year is that re really that long. Um, but I don't really, I don't remember how I kind of came across um, financial in investor. Um, but if you guys are interested in kicking over to a channel, certainly I always try to throw a shout out to those channel creators. Um, I only ho hold VOO, Apple, laugh out loud. I tell you what, man, that, that can get it done. Sometimes the most boring, you know, approach to the stock market is the very best. Sometimes in times like these that are volatile, you'll be like, okay, I only own Apple. I own VOO. I don't have to do anything with that. That's on autopilot. Apple takes a leg down this week, right? Now you've got some investment capital to throw right back on Apple, right? Um, because I've seen Apple do this. this Apple's funny. It really is. It's amazing how it can go from beloved to hate it. It seems like overnight, all in one week, you know, and I just laugh because I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Um, Apple is one of those very few products that I've ever bought in my life. I love it. I absolutely love it. When I actually turn it on, it actually works. Um, when I when I need longevity out of my equipment, it actually works. Um, I've ran my iPod through the washer twice and it works. Um their customer support is phenomenal. Their ecosystem is phenomenal. Um, what can I say? And, and I don't think I'm the only one actually that loves Apple product and, and it resonates with me. So I don't mind being a stockholder in the company. Um, I've got about 61 shares of Apple right now, guys, just for your interest sake. Um, but uh, I try to get to some of these questions here. I'm, I'm scanning through. So if I do miss one, please just stop me and let me know. Um, thanks for your service. Uh, no problem. I tell you what, when I joined, it, it saved my life, actually. It saved my life. Go go commercial fishing and see how long you can do that um, without getting a little bit batty upstairs. It, it's, it, I was ready for a change and it saved my life. No doubt about it. I'm, 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 I'm happy. I'm very, very happy. Um, how do you feel about marijuana investing? That's awesome. I get hit with this every single week. week. No, no pun intended. That was a joke. That's my dry humor. Isn't that great? Yeah, I don't script any of this. So, yeah, I get hit with this every week. So, um, yeah, uh, GW Pharma. And I think it's probably one of the um, most intriguing times um, to, to invest in this industry. Um, I don't know much about it, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, I come across some research topics um, especially in Canada, I've talked about how much more advanced they are. I don't know um, what type of progress we're making on the um, federal legislation 
piece or if we're just going to keep on um, chipping away at the legalization from a state level. I, I don't really know about this conflict coming to a head between the federal law and the state law. Um, but as far as the benefits of the product, especially from the medical side, that they're, they're really undeniable, no doubt about it. And I've said many, many times, um, you know, if I was a parent and I was struggling with my child being sick, I would, I would do whatever I needed to do to make sure that they had the relief that they sought out. And in some states, they can't seek that relief. And in other states, they're having to move to, to actually find that politically they're accepted to be able to offer that for their children. And that resonates with me. It really does. Um, but as far as offering any of the companies, you know, GW Pharma went up pretty good this week. It took a leg down with the rest of the market today. Um, but that's really the, the, the only solidified company. I'm not really into, I do have a watch list. And I do videos on how you guys can utilize your tools within your trading platform. And I, I have a watch list of, of all of the MJ stocks that I'm following. Um, but as far as putting my hard earned dollars into it in my, in my uh, retirement, it's something that I'm just not interested in. Um, I wish I could tell you a little bit more. Um, certainly if there's somebody that actually follows that particular subsector, um, cause I do consider it a subsector. Um, um, certainly somebody can, can reach out to that, uh, Doug, that was a good question. I, I appreciate it. I wish I could give you more on it. Um, that's what little bit I've got on it. Do I, do I think people are going to try to invest in MJ to try to, um, get wealthy? Probably. Um, I just, I don't invest that way. Okay. You know, it kind of, it kind of goes in the same realm with me as Bitcoin, I'm not interested really in either one of those categories. Um, can you make a lot of money? Absolutely, absolutely. And if you can make money, if you know something in way of a tip or whatnot, drop it in the Facebook group and we can discuss it there. That would be awesome. It's just not something that I invest in because I just named you my 10 stocks that I don't invest in. I would much rather buy 3M, you know, I would, I would rather buy Stars Constellation brands it's really one of my favorite beverage companies that I don't own. I actually own Diageo. I do not own Stars Constellation. Um, and they just uh, entered into a huge contractual deal um, dabbling in MJ for the very first time. So some exciting stuff. It cannot be ignored. And there's there's going to be a ton of money made. I just, I would premise my community and my audience to be careful, okay? Because where you can make a lot of money quick, you can also lose a lot of money quick. Bitcoin, okay, for example. It's the same thing with MJ investing, okay? So so thank you. Yeah, Aurora is one that I have in my watch list. Um, ACB, so Doug's throwing out some ticker symbols there in the group. I appreciate that, thank you. That's awesome. Um, those are in my watch list as well. Uh, thoughts on cryptocurrency? It's going back up again. That's my thoughts. I think there's going to be a ton of people making a lot of money off of crypto. No doubt about it. I'm very interested in the uh, blockchain technology. That's what I'm interested in. But as far as putting my hard earned dollars into buying one Bitcoin for $8,500, I will not be doing that. I'm sorry. That's just guys, as an investor, you've got to draw the line. You cannot go down every tangent that comes along in the investing world because you'll tune into my channel. And I'll have a well laid plan out for you. You're going to be a value passive investor. You're going to put cornerstones in your portfolio. You're going to make a little bit of money and you're going to think that you got the thing licked and you're going to think that you can spear off on a tangent of investing in Bitcoin. You have to have rules and you have to have laws in your plan and you have to follow them. And being becoming um, a crypto investor is, is not something I even want to do. I'm not tempted at all to even take 5% of my portfolio. You know, that, that would be... It's going to be 20,000 bucks to buy two Bitcoin. I, I can't do that. No way. I, I, I see the volatility just in investing in regular stocks. Why would I invest in, in something that I watch to go from the $20,000 range down into the five, you know, almost approaching. I thought it was going to go to 5,000 before it went back to 10. It's looking like it's going back to 10. Um, and uh, we'll see where it goes. I'm having a lot of fun sitting on the sideline. I can only imagine the amount of stress that I would incur if I was a Bitcoin investor, and I just, I can't take that on. I can't. So, um, Doug, thank you. Appreciate it, and you're welcome. How much money is needed to start money in the stock market? Um, yeah, so 
Um, you don't need any money to start in the stock market. Um, but I always advocate for saving a starting amount, okay? Anything to get you off of zero, all right? And the reason why I say that is, and I always try to get, I always try to recommend that people try to get up to that $1,000. If it's going to take you 10 years to get to $1,000, uh, okay, but you, you need to have some level of starting amount because when you make that first stock buy, right, or your, that first block of an ETF, for example, $1,000 buys you four, four shares of BOO, all right? And you might not think like that's a lot, but that's a good starting place as far as I'm concerned. Now we can start to dollar cost average on top of that $1,000, right? And we can start to dividend reinvest our ETF payments every quarter. Now at $1,000, that's way more significant um, of a starting place than trying to start at zero and fund the account with let's say $25, $25, because it's gonna take you a while to get up to that amount where you can make that first ETF purchase. Um, and I'd rather see you just save it in cash, pick a big down day in the market and go ahead and make your first starting amount. So even though there's no minimum in the account, to address your question, you can start an account with $25. I just always recommend you having a starting amount, all right? Having a starting amount to kind of get you accelerated off of zero and kind of get you a little bit of head start in the game, all right? That's my advice, all right? How long is your watch list? Um, what other sectors or types of companies um, are you following on a regular basis that you're not invested in? Jeez Louise, that's a good question, Dave. Probably uh, I have, I broke down my watch lists based on the known sectors, okay? So for example, when I come across a good stock um, that I want to follow in my watch list, I'll drop it in there, but it's, it's broken down from technology, staples, um, discretionary, financials, industrials, materials, um, automakers, um, so, so I've got some subsectors, the airlines. Um, so I break it down that way. And anytime a defense, right? I've got MJ. Um, I've got micro cap. I've got good ETF in an, in a, in a watch list. Um, and really, there's no rhyme or reason to doing it. It's that's just kind of how I like to organize. Um, that way, when I come across a defense name that I don't have on my watch list, I can go ahead and filter it over there. Healthcare. Right, for example, um, and I, I've probably all my watch lists are pretty close to full. I think that I can go to 50 um, in each one of my watch lists. They do limit it a little bit. So every now and then I think I'm maxed out on the number of watch lists I've got. I think I can carry, you know, 15 probably. Um, but I've probably got at least 50 stocks in each one of those watch lists. And I, I think, Dave, in, in, in Reference to your question, I don't know if you're asking if I actually cover the stocks as far as like looking at all the balance sheets in my watch list. I don't use watch list for that. I use it for general awareness. And it's amazing how you'll start to commit a lot of these good companies to memory, you know, like Cummins, Caterpillar, John Deere, you know, those are my industrial watch list. It's because I look at them all the time and you can kind of keep tabs on those companies. That way, when you see it, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's it's reported, you know, a down earnings report, for example, it may be providing you an opportunity for an entry point in that good stock. Because those blue chips that I cover, any time's really a good time, relatively speaking, to enter into um, a blue chip stock name like a Caterpillar or a Cummins or a John Deere, et cetera. Those are the stocks that are going to pay you back over time anyway. Um, so I don't get too wrapped around the axle on trying to find the perfect entry point. If I want a stock, I buy it. And I don't mind taking good stocks into downturns um, with the eventual, right, um, you know, making the money long term down the line. So that's a good question. I hope that helps. But I, I tend to use my watch list more for just reference and ease of reference and organization of what is the there's a lot of stocks out there, guys, um, but there's probably only a few hundred that I would ever think about even putting my money in. All right. How about Vanguard ETF? Yeah, Sean. So um, I own three right now. Um, I'm a huge advocate of the VTI, which is the Vanguard's total index. It's VTI um, and then VOO, which is the S&P 500 index fund. Um, and I invest in both of those. I've got 90 shares right now 
100 shares of VOO and 125 of VTI. Um, I also kind of made the mistake of buying the VPU at a bad time. I would have said it was a success if I had bought the utilities ETF and it had gone up. Um, that's not what happened. I'm down 10% in that uh, ETF and I'm just waiting it out. It's fine. It's still a diversified asset. It's got holdings in there that I wanted to have exposure to. And I was able to set that amount in that uh, utilities ETF to, to match the 3% of allocation that I wanted for my portfolio. And so instead of buying the individual stocks, that's what I ended up doing. Instead of buying Duke Energy um, and some of the other utilities names that I wanted, I just bought that v, that, that utilities index um, or utilities ETF, excuse me, from Vanguard. Um, but uh, I've kind of tended to stray away from recommending sector specific ETFs. Um, I like more broad based diversified ETF exposure. All right. Um, so thank you, Sean, for that question. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, that the Vanguard ETFs is kind of my bread and butter. Um, I've done very in-depth uh, discussions about comparing Vanguard's ETFs with their index funds, both on the Admiral share side of the house and the investor side of the house. So I highly encourage you to watch my video on index funds versus ETFs, because that's exactly what I talk about. And it's an eye opener, no doubt about it. Um, what are your thoughts on Chesapeake Energy? Shares are about $3 now. I might grab some small amount of shares um, in my Robin Hood. Yeah, take a crack at it. Um, I know Scrivener follows um, Chesapeake. I know he's been a longtime investor in the stock. Um, one of my favorite natural gas plays is actually Devon Energy, which is trades under the tick or symbol DVN. If you guys want to put 10 shares in, into a stock, um, at $340, Devon Energy will get it done for you. Those guys have the exposure. They're out of uh, Oklahoma, I believe, is their headquarters. And they've got some really, really good exposure. And they're one of the best natural gas plays um, out there. So DVN um, for a, a good investment there. If you've got $3,400, man, a 100 share block will really get you done in Devon, Devon Energy. No doubt about it. Um, um I like the tech, but won't touch it. Can't can't basis off anything. I I, I assume he's talking about uh, Apple computers. <laughs> so uh, I I own a lot of CHK as well. Awesome. I hope it kills it for you guys. I mean, could it go? Could it could it double for you? Absolutely. It could double and go to six. Man, I have just seen it stuck in this range. It's like AMD. I watch it in the same range um, every single day. Can you please recommend the materials sector stock? Absolutely, Nyella. I will do that for you. My absolute favorite material stock right now, um, it would kind of depend on whether or not you wanted a value play or a growth play. Right now from the value play, I don't think you can get any better than 3M, trading under the ticker symbol MMM, okay? Um, kind of on the growth side, um, I would say that Prax Air is, is my favorite on the growth side of the house. And you've got a little bit of reduction on Prax Air. Trades under the ticker symbol PX. Um, and those are both really good options. 3M is going to be your big company. It's very, very diversified. Um, but I, I would look at 3M um, materials, uh, Prax Air, um, and then I also own uh, Dow DuPont as well. Um, and Dow DuPont um, is, is actually come off of where I bought it from in the high 60s. I think it's in the mid 60s right now as a stock price. Um, so you could probably look at uh, their Dow DuPont. So see golf fish hit, hit you up there um, with the uh, merger between both Dow and DuPont. They've come together in the same company and that'll get you done long term. Very safe long-term value play. Um, I concur with that pick, no doubt about it. So, um, but uh, yeah, Praxair or uh, Dow DuPont on the material side. Um, I'll probably think of 10 more after this live feed and I'll kick them over to you if you'd like in the Facebook group, no doubt. So, yep. Thoughts about investing in Tesla? Um, I'd rather go to Las Vegas. I don't think Tesla is an investment, is it? I mean, 
here's the thing. If you put your money on Tesla, you may make a lot of money. Hell, you might double your money. I, I don't know. But as far as like investing in a company that doesn't make any money, um, I think is absurd. Um, if you want to invest in an auto stock, buy GM. 4% dividend trading at a reasonable valuation. Um, Tesla hasn't made a dime. And it, it seems as if that, comp that company is just as satisfied running it into the ground. Honestly, I, I don't know what they're doing. Just continually, um, you know, um, running the company into into debt. Uh, I'm, I, I would never put one dollar in Tesla. I'm sorry. And, and I, here's the thing with with regard to my recommendations, guys, you have to understand I'm not trying to be rude. It's just you ask me and I'm going to give you a carte blanche answer. And it doesn't mean that you can't make money off of Tesla. OK, but investing in Tesla is is not something that I even put in the same conversation because I, I don't look at putting money into Tesla as an investment. I don't. I look at it as a, 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 an educated guess as to whether or not you might make a quick 20, 30, 40, 50 percent on your money. That's great. I just I don't put my money to work that way. I don't. I, I would rather buy an old school. I mean, but look at General uh, General Electric. Look at the turnaround today. Um, I, I'd rather at, at $13, $14 a General Electric today, you got a, a little bit of a, a spike today, a little bit of, I mean, it, it's been on life support, guys. It's been crushed. Got a little bit of life today on General Electric. And I, I'd rather, instead of paying $300 a share for Tesla, um, why, why don't you put, put that money to work in General Electric? General Electric might be a doubler. So l let's just play a little game and see where Tesla goes from here at 300 and where General Electric goes from 15, and we'll see who's smiling at the end of that, you know? Um, it's amazing, the stock market is amazing that way, in that, you know, Tesla's in one of those camps that it's always giving that blessing, you know? Whereas a company like Apple, it's seemingly always picked at, you know, it always trades at a reduced valuation. And I've never really understood it, never really understood. I hope that answers your question. Um, don't don't take me the wrong way. It's just um, I, I'm, I'm not an investor in Tesla, nor will I ever be, ever. Um. <clears throat> oh, nice. Somebody asked about uh, uh, go to trade, dividend, reinvestment settings. So, so I must have missed something there. Thank you, Brent. Just talking about the setting in uh, Merrill Edge to actually set up your dividend reinvestment program. Yeah, the drop down will tell you reinvest dividends and capital gains. It's very simple, very simple. Um, Brent's asking, can you buy VOO with 100 using M1 Finance due to partial shares? That's what my wife did. That's one of the benefits. Um, we had a discussion a couple months back on this um, that I remember, and I, I thought that was a really, really cool benefit to it. It kind of alleviates what I talk about building up a starting amount in that M1 Finance offers the partial share option. So for somebody that doesn't have but a few hundred dollars to start, but really wants to start in the stock market, M1 really gives you that option to kind of start that and buy the buy into those partial shares. That's a really cool comeback. Thank you, Brett. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> Chad is a bit behind. Um, I now see what you were saying about the crazy BX dividends. Yeah, Mike. So, yeah, I, I and I, I actually just, it was funny we were talking about that last week because I just heard a comeback on BX. It's been private for, it's been public for about 11 years now. And um, they're actually, they've got some big talks right now about some huge deal that's supposed to happen. Um, and they're actually talking about BX going to 100. Um, they're actually saying that it, it should be a hundred dollar stock right now, um, with the holdings that they've got, but there's one piece, um, in, in the limited partnership that they have, um, that's kind of holding the stock back. That's why it's kind of traded in this 30, um, all the way down to $20 range. Um, I I've owned it for the last five, six years. I've been happy to own it. I've got a ton of free shares out of the deal. Um, and like I said, I, I, I I'm, I'm happy. It's very stable. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to rake in that dividend, man. It's cool when they pay that dividend because they pay it out in like six different chunks. It's pretty cool. And I've got about I've got about 160 shares, I think, of BX right now. Um, so I'm happy. 
It's 9.46. Holy moly, you just made my Friday night. It does. It's weird. It fluctuates. That's as high as I've ever seen. Um, but when I bought it, it was around 8.5%, I think. It's went all the way down to the to the 5.5 range. But it does. It fluctuates. It's pretty cool. I hope you enjoy owning the stock. That's pretty cool. A 30 share position is a pretty good baseline. And, and like I said, I, I don't look at it like a, a stock per se. I just look at it as a healthy alternative to buying into a bond fund. That's all. So hopefully you get some really good reaccumulation out of that um, and you'll own it. But I, I actually think we're due for some pretty good capital appreciation um, in BX. I really do. So hopefully it pays off for you. I'd rather see it pay off for you than some positive advice to you. So I'd love to see it work out for you. Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, can you break down your philosophy as far as knowing when to sell a stock and dump it? Yeah. So my philosophy might really surprise you. And I, I hope I hope you take this the right way. Um, but there are so many people out there that don't even, they, they can't get started in the stock market. Okay. So I always look at selling a stock as being kind of the the after after piece, right? After you've gone through all of the hard work of putting a good account together, right? A good self-directed, tax-protected, wealth-preserved account. Then you get some good assets in there, right? And they run up 20%, right? Is that the time to sell? It could be. It could be. My simple philosophy about when to sell a stock, I've sold a stock when I've been up 2%, okay? Because I wanted to free up some cash flow, okay? My rule is very simple. I do not sell when I'm in the red, okay? Now, I'm going to disclose that I have sold in the red, but do not make a habit of it, okay? Stocks will go down and stocks will go up. Everybody who knows and tuned in to me selling my Amazon stock, you guys see how that worked out? I left $1,500 on the table by selling Amazon in a panic, and I shouldn't have. I broke my own rule, right? Um, I actually bought five shares of it actually this week. I bought back into Amazon this week um, because it's a, it's a company that I wanted to own. But, but my point is for a lot of new investors, the most prudent advice that I would have wanted to hear if I was in your shoes, if I was a young investor, is for somebody to sit across from me and tell me that I should never sell. My goal shouldn't be to try to beat the market or sell at a high or get 20% and sell it only to miss out on another 20%. If you want to invest in an Apple stock, invest in the long-term accumulation. Now we're talking about the potential for hundreds of percent, maybe even thousands of percent over the long term. Because what gets missed all the time is when that dividend gets paid to you every quarter, it gets paid. Every quarter, it gets paid. And it accumulates over time. If you're continually cutting the top of the tree off or you're continually not letting your tree grow, right? Think about it from an uh, as an analogy, right? If you're growing and you're continually cutting the tree off at the stock, you're not allowing it to grow and produce that fruit the way it can produce. So what I mean by that is if you're entering a stock like Procter & Gamble, J&J, &J, you know, Apple Computers, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, you got to let them grow and you have to allow those dividends to accumulate. And there's way more value in me pr providing that advice to you guys as a new investor than telling you, okay, abide by a 50% rule. If you're up 50%, take some profits and put it to work into something else. Why would you do that? What if you take that 50% and you invest it into a stock and that stock that you just invested in goes down, right? So you continually play this game with yourself. And that's what I kind of continue can uh, consider tinkering inside your retirement account. And it can really hamper your long-term um, returns. The longer you can hold a stock in your self-directed portfolio, the better off you're going to be. If you can own it for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, let's let's let the chips fall where they may in the future. But if I told you to buy a stock and sell it on the short, you know, five days, a month, two months, six months later, that's very, very short-sighted. 
very short-sighted and short-sighted thinking really doesn't have a whole lot of place in the stock market. That's my philosophy on selling. And I hope it really resonated with you because that kind of comes from the heart a little bit on some of the biggest mistakes that I've ever made in my past is selling. If I could have just bought Apple and just hold on to that stupid stock my entire life, I would have been so much better off right now. So much better. And so for you guys listening to me, just, just listen, look at the historical performance of some of these stocks. If you were going to buy an Intel right now, Intel's going to go up, okay? But buy Intel for the next 10, 20 years. Don't just buy it and take that 20% ride up and think that you're going to sell it and get into something else and continually, you know, reproduce that type of result because it's very difficult to do that. The safest way to do it is to buy good quality passive assets and, and good quality stocks that pay a good, healthy, rising dividend and just to keep them forever, okay? Get that account to retirement eligibility. Then you can talk about maybe liquidating some assets, okay? Can you break down your flight? Okay. Um, how do you feel about buying large amounts of shares? Recently bought a new airline uh, called Canada Jet Airline, uh, 60,000 shares at 32 cents. Uh, and went to a dollar twenty-five, cashed in twenty grand. Th that's a fantastic, Doug. Hey, that's a good profit. I tell you what, man. If you want my independent investor channel advice, um, I would take that profit and put it to work into something safe. Because listen, you you're not going to be able to replicate that. You are not. All right. Um, it's funny. I just put uh, um, I just put a trade on today at thirty cents a share. Um, on a speculative stock. It's the only one in my portfolio and it's on, um, it's on C drill, C drillers, I believe. Uh, I don't know the ticker symbol offline, but I tell you what guys, if you're not in my Facebook group, I will drop my trade. I picked up 5,000 shares of it. Um, we'll see what it does. Um, it just came out of chapter 11 bankruptcy and um, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with it. I'm going to hold it. It's fine. Um, I, I just, it's a small position, $1,500. So we'll see what happens. Um, but I, I actually typically don't invest like that. Um, and I don't really recommending buying, you know, companies with less than a billion dollar market cap. And most of the blue chip names that I recommend to my new investors, I want I don't want to see them get hurt. I don't want to see somebody invest, you know, a, a big piece of capital into a risky stock like that and take a haircut of 50%, man. It'll turn them off of the stock market. And that's not what we're looking to do here at all. Um, but that's a that's a hell of a profit, man. And I would take that profit and I would I would actually roll them into a, a, a passive vehicle. I put the whole thing on VOO, put the whole thing on VTI. You're going to enjoy, uh, you know, seven, eight uh, percent uh, accumulation going forward. So good luck. Uh, then it came back to 80 cents. Yeah, you got lucky. I mean, you got lucky. I, I, I don't necessarily put that in the camp of investing. But I tell you what, at the end of the day, I've said this a few times, this is a money game. You know, it's a money game. And if you've made money in a trade, I cannot fault you for that. I can't. If you had research or if you didn't or if you got lucky, I don't know if you would admit that there's a little bit of luck involved in that. Um, hopefully you would. It's not a lot of skill when you're talking about that, um, unless you've got some information um, to let to lead you to believe that the stock was going to go up. But I think that's awesome. I love to see people succeed in the stock market. There, there's there's a, an infinite amount of ways to make money in the stock market. I've done it too. I've short traded stock as well. Um, but typically the audience that I'm trying to talk to that are new investors looking to get started, uh, typically try to get them started in a, you know, a, a $35 a share Pfizer to start, you know, something really, really safe. Um, and that way they're not going to get hurt. So, uh, this is just unpredictable. Yeah, well, it's a good profit. Hey, 20 grand. That's it, man. That's a good start. Just don't get overzealous. I'm serious. You know, to heed my advice, man, I've got a lot of experience, man, a lot. If in the wrong hands, you know, that $20,000 profit, they, they think that they can kind of like kind of control it a little bit and, and it kind of gets out of hand a little bit. You know, you go on tilt and you end up losing it. You know, it's easy. It's easy to lose, too. No doubt. Besides Robinhood, what brokerages do you recommend? TD Ameritrade or Charles Schwab? Um, both of them are very good. Really just kind of comes down to aesthetics. I highly recommend. I know. So, yep, I knew Brent would come through. 
Um, you see the financial investor right below you there with Merrill Edge. Um, Robinhood can be very good. It's a no, it's a no fee brokerage. So I'm all about it. M1 Finance, I know he specifically uses um, prefer one with retirement accounts. Definitely. I agree with that. Um, so there you go. Um, those are the best. Um, Vanguard, I've got a few of my subscribers with Vanguard. It, it really just kind of comes down to what type of trading tools maybe they offer to you. Um, I always premise you guys to really understand the long-term incentives down the line, because I'd really like to see you make this decision on what brokerage house to go with um, only to keep it in the future. I don't want you to second guess your, you know, your, your, um, your decision now. Um, so definitely understand what those incentive thresholds are. What I mean by that is what dollar amount do you need to get to, to realize some free trades within that account? And it's very important. Okay. Um, so just some things to kind of keep in mind. I'm with Merrill Edge. I, I, I'm happy with them. They're very good. Um, this stock will go up again. <laughs> You're living dangerously, man. It's awesome. It take a trip to Vegas with that $20,000 of earnings you got, man. Very cool. What do you think about Facebook? Um, I'm long Facebook. 75 shares is what I've got. Um, I, I have no problem earning owning Facebook. It's actually one of the best growth and value plays actually right now. And I, I think they're probably they floated really in their um, price to earnings um, with the fluctuation in the stock price. But um, I think right now, Facebook, 40% growth, you know, you're, you're looking at probably 30 times uh, forward earnings. I, I think it's a steal, no doubt about it. But I don't want to see Facebook um, put into a bunch of portfolios where it doesn't fit. Okay. Facebook can absolutely be that aggressive play in any one of your guys's portfolios, but I don't want to see Facebook put in there with the expense of a good passive East ETF or good cornerstones in that. If you want to take 5%, let's say, of a $10,000 position, put $500 in Facebook, that's the type of relativity that I'm kind of talking about. But I absolutely endorse Facebook, no doubt about it. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm at 75 shares in Facebook and I'll, I'll continue to accumulate the shares going forward. How about Raytheon? Yeah, the entire defense sector right now is a buy. Let's just make it easy. This K97 uh, with Raytheon, um, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, um, probably throw Boeing in there. Why not? And then uh, Stryker as well. So that's the entire defense sector right now is a is a buy. It's a buy. Um, the unfortunate part about investing in subsectors um, and you know, defense is a subsector of the industrials um, sector. Um, you know, if you get a geopolitical calming, you know, with regard to the North Korea situation, um, potentially, you know, you, you could really see a quick cooling off of the defense sector. And that, that might adjust back on your portfolio. But these guys are landing some huge contracts right now. Um, and I definitely think the defense sector right now is a buy, no doubt. Um, don't don't overexpose. Buy a couple shares. Um, these need to be relative to your total overall holdings in your portfolio. You don't want to get crazy with having your entire portfolio just full of defense names. All right. Uh, so good stuff. Uh, uh, you're welcome, Doug. Thank you, man. Hey, congrats on that that trade, man. I, I that's a good that's a good deal, man. Twenty grand. I'm I'm all about that for you guys. Uh, I want nothing but success for you guys. You just keep it in perspective. That's the important part. So good, good stuff. Yep. K9, no, no doubt about it. Um, listen, I've been going on for about a, an hour. Guys, stand by. I'm going to be coming out with, uh, um, you know, my portfolio snapshot. You guys can kind of see um, how I deploy some of these. I'm going to kind of break it down to let you guys know some of the holdings that I've held long term for years and what they kind of turned into. And you guys can kind of see firsthand what I'm talking about. You know, you're not going to buy a Johnson and Johnson and have it make you a millionaire overnight. You're not going to buy Procter and Gamble. You're not going to buy Apple. Disney is hovering around a hundred dollars, like it was just it, like it's married to a hundred dollars. But I really think you guys are going to understand why you're a value investor. You can sleep easy at night knowing that you're part of these great proven companies and that you can 
really participate in the success of these companies going forward. And it's not going to be evident overnight. It's not. But what's one thing is going to be certain is that if you can get these things into an account that's going to tax protect your accumulation going forward and also help wealth preserve your holdings within your self-directed account, it, it there's nothing else that makes any more sense to me to recommend to folks um, to really um, read Disney article on Seeking Alpha by Dalton Hicks. Awesome. I will do that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, uh, th thought you'd like to know I got my dad into self-directed. Hey, that that's killer, man. That's right. Now you're you're actually reminded me about the conversation we had last week about your dad. That's very cool. He couldn't believe the fees he was paying until I showed him. Um, without your channel, I would have went the same route. Hey, th that that right there, my brother, is the that is the sheer essence of why I do this. Because if you don't hear this through friends and family, you're freaking not going to hear it anywhere else. You're not. I mean, I, I had family turn me onto it and um, it was revolutionary. I mean, look at what I'm doing now. I'm, I started a YouTube channel, um, that of which I would have never have done because this just isn't me. It's not me. I, I'm this, this not me. Um, but um, that very reason right there is the sheer reason as to why I put this message out there. And, because I can, I can guarantee you this. There's, there's, there's very few guarantees in investing. All right. But that's one of them. That is one guarantee right there where you're actually putting the chips where they belong and you're putting it on your side. You're putting it on your side. You're not just giving away the farm, you know, to somebody with the hope that they're going to provide you some type of strategic advantage, man. And uh, yeah, hey, man, that that's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm so happy for you and I'm happy for your dad. Um, but you guys have made the right decision, man. If your dad's got, you know, you know, 20, 30 years of investing left in front of him. Hell, if he's got 10 years, man, uh, very few people ever end up on the right path to investing. Most, most people are naive about investing and they think they've got it figured out and they just remain naive the whole time, which honestly, the scary part about it is, is I would have been that same person. I would have been the exact same person to think because, you know, there's a lot of people out there that want to invest and do the right thing but very, very few people know about this very essence of why I came out with this channel. So thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate it, man. Give a shout out to your dad. If he's got any questions, man, do not hesitate to just hit me up. Hit me up in private if you'd like to, no big deal. But I, I'll be the first to tell you, man, congratulations. No doubt about it, because it was, it was freaking life-changing for me. And I hope that resonates with everybody that tunes into the channel, no doubt about it. So. Ernesto just kicked on. That's really cool, man. Shout out to you, man. Um, meeting some very cool personalities through the channel. Um, very cool. I've probably got really good engagement with about three or four or 500 people. Um, pretty cool. I've got over 3,000 subscribers now. And I thank you for that. For you guys that are new to the channel, um, if you don't quite understand the message right away, give it a little bit of time. Okay. In time, this will make more sense to you and eventually it will make all the sense to you, all right? Because um, we really do deliver a niche on the channel, man, and there's a lot of people who are really coming into coming to terms with how beneficial this program can be, especially if you start tacking on a few decades to your investment, uh, to your investment portfolio under this particular system, guys. So you're gonna see um, the results of liberated dollars going forward, guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna I'm gonna kick off a little bit here. Um, I'm been going for an hour and 15 minutes, man. We will continue to just every Friday. I enjoy the heck out of it, man. I get something out of it every single time I do it. It's very cool to engage with my my group. I, I wish you all the best. I just feel like I'm a normal fella on here having just a regular conversation. I want to give a shout out to the channel creators that have made it onto the channel. Uh, financial Inf Investor, um, one of the originals, Dave from Average Joe Investor kicked on. I think he's kicked off now, um, but I really appreciate him coming on for the beginning of the, of the, of the live feed. And then there was a couple more channels on here. Uh, for you guys that are channel creators, I really appreciate you spending some time on here. And actually you've helped immensely um, answer some of the group's questions that they've got. Um, and hopefully you're you're a little more wiser to it, you know. Um, spend a little time on a Friday evening, man, talking about finances. Hell, we didn't talk about this in school growing up. 
you might as well spend a little bit of time um, in a little bit of self-education on a pretty cool leisurely platform talking about finances and investing in the stock market in the correct way. Guys, thanks again for tuning in, man. I'm going to kind of log off the live stream now. Um, we'll kick you in the Facebook group um, and we'll continue the discussion over there. But thank you so much for tuning in on a Friday. Have a good weekend, guys. I really appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Thank you.